Um, good evening again. Now the tough question. Nikki, how much time do we have available? Minus five minutes. That's what I, how I interpret it, the, the non-match. Uh, I'll try to be short. Dear ARPA graduates, congratulations. You successfully completed a very challenging learning journey, the ALBA learning journey, and you should be proud of it. And we all are proud of you. Graduations are paradoxical and transformative. Paradoxical because the ceremony combines two things, an end, and the beginning, and transformative because when uh, students walk into a graduation, they are students, and when they walk out from the graduation, they are alumni of the same family, of the school's family. When you walk in, you were a student, and you achieved a learning, personal, and professional development where you all learn how to learn, how to unlearn, and how to relearn. Now that you are graduates, you're joining a prestigious and dynamic network of almost 4,000 alumni, ALBA alumni, in Greece and around the globe and also, you are joining thousands of, a, a network of thousands of accomplished managers that have experienced the ALBA learning journey through our executive development programs as well. Now that you are graduating, I would also like to share a few thoughts with you. Several years ago, John Smith I have to go, I guess. <laughs> John Smith, a young man raised in Idaho in the United States, he graduated from a local high school located in a very small Idaho town. John graduated with the highest grades ever in the state of Idaho. A brilliant kid, a marvelous person, a great mind. As you can easily guess, all top schools in the United States offered him a scholarship to study in their undergraduate programs. He decided to study economics and he accepted an offer from the top economics department in the country in a metropolitan area in, in the East Coast. He entered the school and uh, he was assigned as an advisor to report to a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, who was teaching that period of time in this particular department. Sometime early in the spring, February of the freshman year, John sets up an appointment with my friend and visits his friend in his office. This is usually a good time because John was doing great in school and my friend was very happy to have a meeting with somebody who was doing great in school. Usually these are great meetings. My friend congratulated John for his achievement so far in the top economics department in the country. And uh, he thought that that would be it. In fact, he was unpleasantly surprised. John accused the economics department 
of failing miserably because having been the top economics department, they didn't manage to solve the problems, the problem of homeless in the city the school was located. He said to my friend, what have you done with your economics models if you haven't solved the problems of home homeless people in this local city? In his city, when he grew up, they didn't have homeless, so it was shocked for him. My friend was curious. How do you dare to talk to me like that and accuse that the top economics department is failing when three Nobel laureates are teaching in this economic department? But my friend maintained his composure and didn't say anything. Then John said to my friend, well, I made a decision. This summer, when the school is over, I'm not going to go back to see my family. I'll stick in the, in the city to solve the, home, the homeless problem. My friend said to himself, oh, well, kids, what do they know of reality? And both went along for their summer plans. Early in the fall, John comes back, sets up a new appointment with my friend, his advisor. And then after the, hi, how are you doing and how was your summer? Then my friend asked John, how did you spend your summer? He said, well, I stick around. And what did you do? I went to the church where I go on Sundays and I asked the priest to give me some money and I bought groceries food for the homeless people and I delivered it to the homeless people. And then, well, the priest introduced me to other priests in the city and I did the same and I got money and I was delivering food to homeless people. Hmm. My friend said, you've done a good job. Next fall, next spring, again John goes to the, my friend's office and says, well, this summer, I'm not going to go back to my home to see my friends and family. I'll stick around here to solve the homeless problem. Now my friend didn't say anything. Next fall, John comes back and reports. What did you do over the summer? Well, I went to the alumni office of the school. I got a list and I started calling these big shots and I start asking for donations. And based on that, I, I established a non-for-profit organization to collect funds and help the homeless people. Has his self, now, his non-for-profit organization is one of the most well-known uh, non-for-profit organizations serving the community, not only in that particular city, but around the United States. Has he solved the homeless problem? Perhaps not. But he learned that, in paraphrasing John Kennedy's famous quote, ask not what the society can do for you, ask what you can do for the society. This is very transformative and this is very disruptive because people say that human nature is to think about ourselves. John, a brilliant mind, he didn't think about himself. He think about the other. He went beyond ego and he found a sea the others, the society. And he took an initiative. He didn't expect anybody to solve the problem. He took an initiative to solve the problem for the sake of the others. A friend of mine is raising a young teenager. Once the teenager comes back from school very disappointed. 
he asked her, what happened in school? She said that we flunked a math exam. And then what? And then his daughter said, well, together we got together, all friends, and we start saying, well, now we don't have any hope in school because we flunked the math exam. And what are we going to do in life? And one person said, one friend said, well, I know how to clean things, so I'll become a cleaning person. I don't know anything, she said to my friend. The only thing I know is that I make some coffee to you. So I'll open a coffee place, a cafe neo. My friend said, my dear, I'm very proud of you. The daughter said, come on, dad. I'm speaking seriously. Well, if your Cafe Neo is the next Starbucks, I'll be the proud father of the owner of the Starbucks. As James Buchanan, the 1986 Nobel Prize in Economics wrote, why do I continue to work? Why I, I do not retire gracefully to my mountain farm in Virginia? Since I have acknowledged that I do not presume to move the world unaided, what inner force drives me? My answer is simple and straightforward. I work because I enjoyed it. I get utility in ideas, in thinking, in organizing my thoughts, in writing these th thoughts in coherent arguments, in seeing my words in manuscript and in print. I'm also a lecturer, perhaps a century out of date, a Nobel Prize laureate says that, and I get utility from the respective feedback from an intellectually competent audience. Here again, my ultimate purpose, either in writing or in lecturing, is not so much to convince readers or listeners of the merits of my arguments as to engage in ongoing discussion. When all is said, I have faced few genuine choices between work and play because there's, there is really no distinction. My work is my play, and I'm surely among the fortunate in this as in so many other aspects of a happy and well-ordered life. Dear graduates, it's not about what, do we, what we do in life, but how we do it. It's about how much passion, love, and soul we put into what we do that really matters. Dear ALBA graduates, congratulations for graduating with an ALBA degree. You are now an ALBA branded. Congratulations also to your loved ones for their support, patience, and willingness to share you with ALBA during your studies at ALBA. And finally, a deep appreciation and thanks to the ALBA team, our faculty, and administrators, <laughs> colleagues, for co-creating your learning experience. You take care.